That's right. <laughs> Comes out, huh? <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Santee City Council meeting. Let the record show that the regular meeting of the Santee City Council is now called to order. Let the record uh, reflect that Mayor Minto is absent. Myself, uh, Vice Mayor Dustin Trotter, Council Members Ron Hall, Laura Koval, and Rob McNellis are present. I had to think about. I don't want to make sure I messed that part up. <laughs> so tonight, uh, we have the invocation given by Pastor Zeblin Hill, Zeb, from the Rock Church. So quickly, Zeb, I'm going to give a little bio for you, and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance led uh, by Dale Hansen this evening. <laughs> So Zeb is a campus pastor at the Rock Church in El Cajon Campus, the campus oversight uh, for the multi-site campuses, and has been there for 11 years. Uh, got his degree at the University of Phoenix and Bachelor of Science in Business Management with honors. Zeb uh, has a passion for the community outreach and spiritual growth. He's dedicated the past decade of his life serving as a minister, offering guidance, support, and encouragement to individuals seeking faith-based connections and personal life transformation. His background reflects a steadfast commitment to fostering a sense of belonging and purpose within diverse communities. Zeb, why don't you lead us in the invocation, sir? Thank you, council members and everyone in attendance. Um, before I pray, I feel like the Lord wanted me to just declare something over the city. I felt like he was saying that it's a new city that he's building, not only naturally, but spiritually. Uh, I feel like he's going to restore and rebuild some, some areas of this community, and he's going to use all of us, all of you, to do that. And so uh, I do declare uh, restoration in the cities uh, for those that it may be run down or tore down. I feel like the Lord is going to build that up. So, God, I just thank you. Thank you for this city of Santee. Thank you for the council here, God. Thank you for everyone in attendance. And we thank you that you are doing a new thing, and you are creating a new city in Santee. And so I thank you for the freshness, the life that's going to be poured out and built up over this 2024 year. Thank you for everyone, all the leaders in this room, and I pray that we would all lock arms to be the light in this city for those that need hope. So we thank you and we praise you for this meeting and for this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Up to the lectern, Dale. Come on. <laughs> okay, if you please put your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so the next item we're going to do is... Uh, recognition, certificates of rec recognition for life saves and actions. As you guys can see, we have a pretty full room, pretty full uh, room here tonight, which is super cool. So I'm going to come up front there. And I'm going to ask uh, Simone, would you please uh, come join me up front real quick? How are you? Come on up here. Like I told you, it's going to be a super cool night tonight. So, you guys, I'm going to read a, a little uh, certificate here of recognition. This is for a detailed call for medical aid. So, on December 15th, 2003, we had a 72-year-old male collapse at the softball field at Sportsplex USA here in Santee. The bystanders initiated CPR and delivered two shocks with an AED. The Santee Fire Department crews assumed care and placed the patient on the Lucas mechanical CPR device. Administered additional shocks and gave advanced life support medications. During transport to the hospital, the patient regained a pulse and his care was transferred to the emergency room staff. 
The initial follow-up received from the hospital staff indicated that the patient was making good progress and had a future, uh, good future prog prognosis. The latest report was that the patient was discharged home, awake, alert, and oriented in no distress, and will be following up with his cardiologist. So yes, he was discharged home in good health. So you guys with me right now is his daughter, Simone, standing right here with me, and we're going to do certificate of recognitions for the individuals that helped to save this gentleman's life on December 15th. So what's really cool and unique about this is that sometimes we talk about these cool, fun things we get to do as council members and do these recognitions for individuals in our community and our first responders. I was actually on the engine that day doing a ride-along with our fire department. As many of you know, I do ride-alongs uh, periodically within our city with our sheriff's department and the fire department. I was actually assigned to engine four that day, and Captain Montgomery, uh, which is here now, um, he was our captain th that day. And it was a pretty cool experience, and I get an opportunity here to recognize each of those individuals uh, for their efforts. So the first one I'm going to bring up here is Eddie Vanderveer. Come on up, Eddie. So I'm only going to read this one time, but we're going to recognize each individual here. So the City of Santee Certificate of Recognition, the certificate is proudly presented to Eddie Vanderveer. The City of Santee would like to recognize Eddie for his responding to a medical emergency at the Sportsplex December 15, 2023, and helping to save a life. So why don't you give these to these individuals, okay? So Eddie, I'm going to give you this microphone real quick, and I want you just to tell everybody about the AED at Sportsplex USA. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, and um, you know, thank you for this. I really appreciate it, and you know, it was a big group effort from everybody there, from the uh, senior softball players that were out there playing, to the um, sheriff's uh, deputies that came out and resumed CPR, to the fire folks that came out and um, transported him and got him, brought him back. So. Um, we're, we're really um, thankful that uh, Sportsplex has been open for about 14 years now, going on 14 years. That'll make some of you feel very old. Um, Are you looking at me? I'm not. Uh, and uh, 13 and a half years ago, about three or four months after we opened, um, those of you who might remember Captain John Sangenbush, uh, he went out and made a point to come introduce himself and asked if we would be open to him uh, raising money to buy us an AED as he likes to do and running around the, uh, the city making sure that big uh, facilities have them. And uh, we've had in the 14 years, um, we've had four uh, times that we've used that and uh, been successful. I can't stress enough uh, those groups that have a lot of people coming through like we do. We had close to 400,000 people come in the gates of the Sportsplex last year. And uh, it's a blessing to have that. We're fortunate that uh, we, we have that because uh, when situations like this happen, we're able to, uh, to administer it, and it, it helps. It helped in this situation. So, again, thank you, and uh, thank you for this. Appreciate Absolutely. it. You guys, the, the AED and uh, Sports Flex, like uh, Eddie talked about, but also the Firefighters Association, donates many uh, AEDs to uh, local businesses here in Santee. So it's a tool that obviously helped to uh, save Dave's life that day. So a couple of people I'm going to bring up here. These are actually some of the softball uh, members that uh, administered an initial CPR. Uh, Dan Daniel King. Yeah, I want, to, I want everybody to stay up here. You're going to give all these to these people, OK? <laughs> you took my other two? Yes, please. So the next two individuals uh, were not able to make it tonight. Obviously, doing a lot of people. We have to get the scheduling and try to just make this happen at the end of the day. So the next two people, uh, David Bradford and Norm Young, um, they, they jumped in there with Dan and, and, uh, and made it happen, right? That was the, so I'm going to actually just hand these to, to you, maybe, and you can make sure they get them. <laughs> At the end. Okay. At the end. 
So the next two people I'm going to bring up here are the very first uh, first responders that uh, made contact there. So Deputy Rudy Shavari, can I say this right? Shavaria? All right, come on up here, buddy. <laughs> and Deputy Crystal Corona. Yes, yeah, Crystal, Crystal and I, we, I've actually done a ride along with Crystal before and seen what an amazing uh, deputy she is being on patrol here in the city of Santee. So we're super blessed. And these two obviously jumped in there. As soon as they, they got there, they um, administered CPR and just kind of went right into their instincts and their trainings and stuff. We'll talk about some of these other guys in a minute of what the things that they did. So Captain Montgomery, Trevor Montgomery, Captain Montgomery. Stay up here. <laughs> Anywhere. He, he, we're probably going to have to split this side, actually, Captain. Captain, you probably want to go on this side. We're going to split this. Christian Prince. <laughs> Curtis Wilson. So guys, these three individuals are the ones that I was on the engine with, uh, Captain Montgomery, firefighter, paramedic uh, Prince, and Engineer Wilson. They're the ones that uh, got us to that incident as, as quickly in a timely manner that we got there and administered CPR. Captain Montgomery and, and, and uh, firefighter Prince, they're the ones that, that picked up the CPR, got the uh, Lucas machine onto the individual, the... Um, IV and all, all the, the and everything else. They're the two that, that really jumped in there and, and got that machine pumping, that Lucas machine. If you've never seen it, it's uh, quite an amazing uh, piece of equipment you guys got right there to work with. So, Next, uh, firefighter uh, paramedic Mark Bari was on the uh, ambulance that day. He's actually not here today, you guys. He's out of town. So we're going to make sure he gets that. So let's go ahead and set it back there, I guess. And last but not least, uh, fighter fire paramedic Corbin Marion. Like I said, Mark and uh, Corbin were actually on the ambulance uh, that came right after, and we had to do the transport in the ambulance. And Captain Montgomery and firefighter Prince went in the ambulance with um, Corbin and Mark to the hospital, to Gross Mall Hospital, and Curtis and I had to stay there and clean up the mess and, and uh, go meet them, you know, as soon as we could. But those four individuals all went in the ambulance and they're the ones that continued to minister uh, the medical aid and, and got his pulse back going in that ambulance and handed them off over to the, uh, to the hospital team over there, right? So, would you like to bring your dad up here? Um, dad, would you like to come up here? <laughs> so you guys... We have the pleasure to show you. Yeah. Hold that. So you guys, this is Dave. This is the individual that all these individuals saved that day. Saved his life, and he's standing here in front of us right now. So I'm sure Simone might want to say one or two things for... She tears up anymore over here, right? <laughs> yep. Uh-oh. Okay, I just want to say um, it's even more special to me because I actually work in the cardiac cath lab. <laughs> so I get these patients all the time, and... It's different when you're on the other side of it. And I also know how, um, how complacent, not complacent, but monotonous the job can get. And, you know, you see so many people all the time. And the stories that are behind these people and their family. And it was on his granddaughter's first birthday, which was even harder. Um, so, and her middle name is June, after David June. So... That would have been a terrible, terrible day <laughs> for him to not make it. 
So thank you guys all for your hard work. Thank you, Eddie, for having an AED at the Sportsplex. Thank you for putting on this awesome ceremony. And we're all just so lucky to have him. As you guys know, anyone who plays softball with my dad in this room, raise your hand. Golf, bowling, all of it. He's a very popular guy. So thank you all. Thank you for coming. So you guys, just in wrapping, these, I wanted to recognize each of these individuals for their, obviously, efforts to save the gentleman's life that, that day. But it's a true testament to their training and what they, they go through to become first responders, be in the law enforcement or in the uh, EMS or firefighting profession, that they knew what to do, how to do it, and, and, and made it happen where we got to save the gentleman's life that day. So, Dave, thank you, thank you sir. Thank you much. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good to go. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Rudy. It's going to take a minute, you guys, to let the room clear out a little bit. No. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? All right. The next items are uh, consent calendar. Are there any items to be added, deleted, or reordered on the agenda? Councilmember Hall? No. Councilmember Cobal? No. Councilmember McNellis? No, Vice Mayor Trotter, there is nothing for me. City Manager? No, sir. City Attorney? Yes, sir. City Clerk? Yes, sir. I have two um, items, one and two speakers on each. One speaker on each, I'm sorry. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Minus so uh, moved. items one and two. Is it one and two or three or four? Oh, oh sorry. So one and, I'm sorry, the speakers on one and two? So it's three yes. and four. That so we're three and approving. four. Three and four. Three and four are what we're yeah, The remainder I, of the consent calendar. Did you motion? Yes. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. You guys please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Well, clerk, can you please call item one? Item number one, approval of reading by title only and waiver of reading in full of ordinances and re resolutions on the agenda. First, the speaker I have is Truth. Hi there. Um, wait a minute. It wasn't the reading that titled Dustin's job. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, but I, you know, I think I found a loophole in this item. I dug real deep. It's a very long item. It's like one page. It says this waiver streamlines the procedure for adopting the ordinances on tonight's agenda, if any. So if there aren't any ordinances, then does that mean that a waiver still needs to be passed? This might be uh, redundant. That's something to think about. Thank you. The next Let's item. Motion to approve item number one. Second. Got a motion and a second. Can please vote. Motion carries unanimously. Kirk, can you please call item two? Item two, approval of payment of demands as presented. The speaker I have is Truth. Thank you for reading that title so clearly. Consultants, um, 
Ecologic Inc., Evan Moser and Skaggs, Hinter Lighter de Yamas, ICF Jones and Stoke, and London Motor. Total $33,600, $33, give or take. Fun fact, though, for everyone so they can know, cities usually employ consultants in order to save money and or free up staff and or to retain services of a group more qualified for the job. stg and &E gouged about $9,000 just off City Hall. Don't you guys want to get rid of them? Uh, it was interesting to learn that there's an Afghan community cultural center. I didn't know that. And I saw um, just because who doesn't like a free shout out? Heather's name was in there. Congratulations. I saw you had a charge for 115. She had to go to a conference. Uh, Dustin, how did he get to this point of vice mayor? This is the answer. He got some training from Cougars for $700. And he's, look, he's moving on up. He's almost mayor. He can even read the proclamations very clearly without stumbling. He knows what city he lives in, isn't complaining. It's very impressive so far. Uh, the county vector control got $587. And I'm wondering... If there were rats here, because I come, did anyone from the West visit? Is that what happened? I'm just kidding. That's it. Thank you. Motion to approve item number two. Second. What kind of motion and second? You guys, please vote. <clears throat> motion carries unanimously. That brings us to a non-agenda public comment. Yes, sir. We have three speakers. Okay, can we please call first, the first speaker. Yes, first speaker I have is Ned Leonard. A reminder to everybody: you have three minutes. Okay. Good evening. I'm Ned Leonard. Um, I'm here representing Sal's Barbershop just down the road here at Masta Magnolia. We're in the Smart and Final Shopping Center. And behind me with the white name tags, there are several other businesses that were able to come after long days of working and be here as well. And my wife, Helen, who you heard from a little while back on a similar issue. Um, the issue is it's kind of an ongoing problem that, like the weeds that are sprouting up after the rains Recently, if you don't take care of it now, it's going to get worse and it's going to have a huge impact on our city quality of life and the businesses are going to start abandoning the shopping center. That's what I'm afraid is going to happen. Helen and I both live here. Some of the uh, shop owners live in Santee, so this is our home and our livelihood. And if it starts to decline, like a lot of cities have declined, our neighborhoods in San Diego have declined. East Village, I drive through that sometimes, and uh, we don't want to go there. Uh, Santee's not like that. Well, specifically, um, you probably heard uh, Friday afternoon we had another incident with, uh, looked like teenagers probably from Santana High School uh, that come over right after school's out. Uh, they loiter, some are good kids waiting for their parents to pick them up, and then others are mixed in that, that are up to no good. They're smoking dope, they're selling dope, they're vaping, uh, which is illegal for that age group. And they're, uh, this time it was a knife fight Friday afternoon, about uh, 3.30 it went down, right in front of our plate glass windows. Luckily, none of our equipment was injured and uh, are hurt, and neither was, uh, they didn't come into the shop this time. But they traveled around and ended up over by, I think, Del Taco, where the uh, knife was pulled out and somebody got hurt this time. So it's starting to accelerate and get worse, and that's why I'm concerned, and that's why I'm here tonight. Um, this has been coming kind of uh, building up quickly uh, as a sort of a curve, and it's the wrong kind of curve. It's going escalating. And uh, this kind of uh, violence is going to get worse, and I'm afraid next time it could be a gun. And like I said, we've witnessed uh, what appears to be drug sales coming out of a vehicle over there. An older guy drives up with a Buick and starts selling. I've taken pictures over to the school and brought it to the principal's attention. And uh, I had a little headway there. I think he was able to identify a couple of the kids involved. And the sheriff's department, I would like to thank them. Most of them left already, but uh, They've stepped up patrols in the last few days since this knifing incident, but it, I'm afraid it's temporary because the last time we had a big issue, uh, they came into the shops and caused problems. There was an Thank you, Ned. Appreciate it. Uh, three minutes, sir, yeah. 
Can but, I jump um, in real quick? Captain, that? Lieutenant, we have his contact information for his business, right? And the, obviously the law enforcement is aware of that. So we're Sean, gonna, can I they're on top of it. Quick comment on that. And Ned, just, just so you know, I, I contacted Jim Kelly of the Grossmont uh, Union High School District, and he's contacting the superintendent. Oh, we're taking it to a higher level at this point. Sheriff's Department is obviously aware of it, okay. and so we're working on it. Thank you, Ned. Thank you, Next speaker I have is Adam Paul. Uh, seems Councilman, how are you guys doing tonight? Hope you're well. Pretty much the same thing. Um, a long-time resident here in Santee. Been here pretty much my whole life, know a ton of people. Uh, my friend Brett Mutaw spoke on this the last time. Um, I frequent uh, Sal's Barbershop every couple months, and obviously that center pretty much every week go get Del Taco and whatnot. You know, I don't, like you say, you, you've obviously contacted Mr. Kelly at the Grossmont Union District, so that's really good. And I see the sheriff's in there, but, you know, something needs to be done because, like, like you know, he said, you know, afraid that a Somebody who's not involved might get attacked, you know, might get hurt next time. Um, that video that was making the rounds on Friday was really bad, and I mean bad, if you've not seen it. Um, like I said, I, you know, talking to the schools, something's obviously got to be done. And I, I, you know, I applaud you guys for making all the efforts, and I just hope that you, everyone st sticks on top of it because these people, they don't deserve that. They're trying to make a living here just like everybody else. Um, that's pretty much all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Next speaker, Truth. <clears throat> I'm actually uh, only back here because, one, I'm hoping this meeting is going to be short, and, two, with all the skip presentations last time, I'm concerned that you guys are becoming lazy, or I've influenced everyone to have way too much fun. But tonight I have a PSA on the dangers of electric vehicles and lithium batteries. This is part of a YouTube video done by the South Metro Fire Rescue out of Colorado. The smoke that's coming off of an electric vehicle is very toxic. The hazardous materials team responded with a specialized electric vehicle fire blanket, which is used to smother the fire. Those blankets cost anywhere between $3,000 and $5,000 and weighs 62 pounds. It takes at least four personnel to put it on the vehicle. They're using respiratory protection while they're doing that, so making sure that their airways are protected from that toxin. Once the vehicles are at the salvage yard, they remain underneath that electric fire blanket, which is limiting the oxygen flow to the battery, which is still smoldering. Some people might be wondering why we don't just use water on that, like a normal vehicle fire, a combustion engine fire, and it's because it's ineffective it's very difficult to get the water where it needs to go into the battery pack and when those lithium-ion batteries are in a thermal runaway situation it can take tens of thousands of gallons of water to extinguish them even in that case if it does extinguish them now we've created a bigger hazardous materials incident with the runoff water. There's also a risk that even after water has been applied and successfully suppressed the fire in that moment, that those batteries will reignite later. This emerging hazard, not only with electric vehicles, but electric mobility devices that have lithium ion batteries, and then certainly all of the small devices that many of us are carrying in our pockets. We recommend that people stay home when they are charging those devices. Bet nobody knew that. Justin, does the Santee Fire Department, oh, he's not here, will, have, will they have, have a whole bunch of one-time-use $5,000 fire blankets? Because if not, then every single lithium battery fire will emit toxic fumes, and again, every single time itself reignites. Electric cars, buses, scooters, and bikes pose one of the biggest fire risks of this era. And the reality is that the so-called green agenda is actually harming the environment and putting people's lives in danger. But lastly, for laughs, I got this from Joel. He's a great comedian. It's out of context, but you're going to appreciate it. This governor's done a lot of good things. I also would be remiss if I didn't do a shout out to Nathan Fletcher. When Nathan got on this board, there was a fundamental change, and I was eager to get elected to this board to be his wingman because I shared his vision. I would increase taxes if I thought I'd get a better retail outcome. And I look back to my years in the state legislature, and just in the last 15 years, our state budget more than tripled. 
and yet our roads aren't improved, our schools aren't fully funded, and mental health has not been addressed. For 12 straight years, I was up there, and perhaps I was part of the problem. Final speaker I have is Dan Bickford. Stabbing at Del Taco, not unpredicted. We've known that problem for years. Years, not just six months ago, not just a few uh, council meetings ago when we had a very tearful business owner up here pleading for something. And we failed them. Every one of us, staff, council, mayor, failed them. What's next? It's not just enough to say, well, our, our sheriff's uh, uh, captain knows. What are you going to do today to stop this? Thank you. No further speakers, sir. All right. Next, uh, con con continue business number five. Clerk, can read the item, please? Cannabis workshop related to manufacturing uses and retail locations in neighborhood commercial zones and clarification about the draft application process for retail business licenses. Sandy. So you guys, hold on. Before uh, we hear the item, I actually need to recuse myself from this item um, from the manufacturing portion of the item as I have real property lease in an industrial park here in the city of Santee. So I need to appoint uh, Councilmember McNellis to run this portion of the meeting in my absence. Can we hear the report? Yes. Good evening. Um, by way of background, I just, hold on, I have to remember I'm doing this myself. <laughs> so by way of background, in March of 2021, City Council directed staff to adopt a cannabis ordinance. In August of 2022, City Council did adopt Ordinance 602, and at that time that permitted up to four retail locations. There was no limitation on testing labs or micro-businesses that did not contain a retail component, but all other types of permits were prohibited. In November of 2022, City Council directed staff to develop an application process for those retail locations. And in December of 2023, staff presented a draft application process and City Council requested a workshop on two facets of the process. So first, the question was, should standalone cannabis manufacturing uses be allowed? Manufacturing uses, as I mentioned, were allowed in the ordinance, but only as a component of micro-businesses. Um, attached to the staff report, there was option one, which shows what it would take in the ordinance through track changes in order to enable standalone manufacturing. I will say that staff does not have a recommendation whether or not to allow standalone manufacturing uses. However, if directed to include in the ordinance, staff recommends that we not allow manufacturing of volatile materials, and that's consistent with what other cities, both in the county and within the state, have done. Um, and due to the conflict, uh, it'd probably be appropriate for the council now to address this specific issue, and then I can present the other item when the vice mayor returns. Before we do that, do we have any speakers that we want to hear just on this specific part? Yes, sir. We have one speaker for manufacturing uses, um, Cameron Pittman. Hello. I just wanted to maybe clarify a little bit around like uh, some of the, the legalities around products that are created. Um, so when we're talking about manufacturing, we're talking about manufacturing cannabis products. Uh, and there are an array of manufactured products that you can, can run with. Uh, through the state license, once you have a local license, with distribution alone, you can package flour, you can roll flour, pre-rolls, or you can jar it. You don't need a manufacturing license in order to do that. I'm naive. What are you talking about, flour? So just the bud, the, <laughs> okay. the, the actual cannabis 
you know, it, it, it hasn't been... Flour to me bakes. Yeah, it hasn't been... I don't been, know. It hasn't <laughs> been... <laughs> Oh it hasn't goodness. been ran through any sort of sort of oh. process. Uh, and, and so now we talk about gummies <coughs> or vape pens uh, or lotions, creams, uh, pills. Uh, those are all different types of manufactured products. Uh, so when we're looking at these manufactured products, when we're specifically talking about volatile substances or, vol- you know, the... the it is when you use butane or an ethanol-based uh, product to process this thing, right? So you uh, that it, it won't limit, if that's what we're looking for, any sort of vape pen production because there are other methods of being able to produce vapes or produce uh, wax uh, without using ethanol without using these volatile substances. Um, so that's kind of just what I kind of want to clarify that the, there, you can still make gummies uh, without, even if you deny the volatile, you can still make creams, certain types of creams, even if you deny the volatile. Specifically, you're looking at, at certain types of vape pens and certain type of concentrate uh, that would be processed using this butane ethanol sort of method. Uh, hopefully that helps clarify a little bit around that, uh, just in case you needed that. Thanks. Any other speakers on that part? I have one speaker uh, for the item as a whole, and then the rest will be the retail. We want to... Do we want to hear that, or do we want to discuss this first? Discuss this. Okay. So Dustin can come back, right? Well, we don't know if the speaker is on, on the manufacturing part or on yeah, the item I'm, as a whole. If I may, I mean, the speak, the, whoever wishes to speak on manufacturing, this is the time to do it. And if you don't speak at this point in time, council is going to deliberate, give direction. We're going to close that portion of the, the discussion. So if you want to talk about manufacturing and you've put in a speaker slip, now is the time to do it. Seeing nobody jump to the lectern there, I guess we are good to discuss it amongst ourselves here. Uh, council members? I have a question. Um, <clears throat> the volatile material, what is the concern around it? Is it the butane? Yeah. What? Exploding. Correct. I mean, correct. It's about explosions and being able to control it. So it's specifically about type 7. It's not about limiting um, distribution of, of anything else or creation. It's just more about creating a hazard. Okay. It gets it gets used quite often in the black markets. Uh, people do it in their houses in the garage and end up blowing up houses and garages using butane to extract the oils um, out of the cannabis. Okay. Well, I agree with the staff recommendation then. For I I agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah. Councilmember Hall. Okay. So. That's, I'm sorry, that was your motion then? Yes, so we should al- allow s- standalone mm-hmm. cannabis manufacturing with the staff recommendation. Um, not allowing. Not allowing volatile materials. And I'll second that motion. Let's vote. We all voted. It's just because I can't do the abstain. Oh, my goodness. Motion carries with three eyes. Thank you. Councilmember Let's, Trotter recuse on this portion. Can we bring uh, Vice Mayor Trotter back into the room so we can get the rest of this discussed? And, and just as he's coming back, just to be clear, we're obviously, we'll bring the ordinance back to you so it'll come back in its final form, but we have that direction, that direction's fixed, so then Council Member, or sorry, Vice Mayor Trotter can return, and we're not going to talk about that issue anymore. We're going to talk about the second one. <laughs> All purpose or, or bread? <laughs> All, right, All right, so, so now I'm back to the meeting, so can we call the remainder of that item, please? Yes. So second question is whether or not retail location should be allowed in neighborhood commercial zone districts. 
Um, the ordinance as it's written now, it's only allowed in light industrial and general commercial. Uh, the definition of a neighborhood commercial zone is that it's intended to provide areas for immediate day-to-day -day convenience shopping and services for the residents of the immediate neighborhood. Um, many neighborhood commercial parcels are within sensitive use buffers, whether or not that's the city's 900 feet buffer or whether or not it's the state's 600 foot buffer. So as an attachment to the staff report, we did provide option two, which shows you what the changes would be in the ordinance if you wanted to allow uh, retail locations in neighborhood commercial zones. Um, there might be additional CEQA review required based off of that determination and have to be decided after this meeting and it would move forward if that was directed by city council. Um, but when we looked at the neighborhood commercial zoned parcels and we applied the buffers that are required, there are only two remaining parcels outside of the existing buffers. So here are the two parcels. As we mentioned, the NC R14 parcel is Lantern Crest, and the NC parcel that's on the right-hand side is a liquor store and the Eagles. Um, so that actually would be the conclusion of my discussion about neighborhood commercial. I can go to next steps. Do you want me to do next steps? Okay. Yeah. Sandy, can you, you said the liquor store in Eagles, can you say what intersection that is? Sure, so it's, can you see my, I don't know if you can see my screen, but there's Woodside, that's, oh yeah, you can see my arrow. And then right there, you've got Shadow Hill, Shadow Hill. Road. I just wanna put it for the record, it's the corner in both sides of Shadow Hill with, uh, and Woodside, the intersection there. Yes, right here, this is the entire parcel, yes. Can I ask what the two buffering zones are? Um, so let me go back to this screen so you can see them. So again, the buffer zones are, I'm going to show that. Can you see right here in this sort of center right-hand side of the map? That's the state buffer zone for a sensitive use of the Lakeside Park, and that's 600. I believe 600. Councilman Hall is referring to the parcel at Woodside and Shadow Hill, the two buffers that are down there. Oh, okay, this one is our city sensitive use um, buffer, which is 900 feet. Did you want to know like what, is it a park, is it a daycare? There's a daycare it, center over like, there. Like that? Okay, that was, yeah. That was, yeah, it's, yeah there's a daycare I thought, center. I thought he was going. So, and what about the two that are just to the west and, and east, south, right? those two? These two NCs, I'd have to check our map. Do you mean the name of it? The name of it, yeah. I, just... uh, I could get the name of it for you, yeah. Oh, that's right. So the one that immediately to the to the east, the southeast, is Shadow Hill Park. Mm -hmm. And then the one across um, the highway, I, I don't know what are the, the buffer zone is there. Is he talking about this? <laughs> yeah. And that. What did you mean when you said Lantern Crest? Uh, the senior uh, facility. I, I, I mean, that, that. I guess I need to go back to that little drawing. Which one? This there, one? There's a, there is a slide on that. Is it? This one? Yeah. So what's, where's Lantern Crest? This is like all Lantern Crest. Are you saying that the, quite large. The, retail shop could be, the retail shop could be allowed on Lantern Crest? We're, we're saying that... If we were to change the ordinance to allow for retail locations in neighborhood commercial zoned parcels, I wanted to find any parcels that were outside of the sensitive use buffers. And so the two parcels that we were able to find are these two parcels. And I wanted to let you know what they're currently being used for so you would know. I mean, that's weird. That's weird. Uh, when we started this whole neighborhood commercial discussion, it wasn't even about these two exactly. locations. It was about... Uh, a location that I thought really didn't, I didn't think it belonged in neighborhood commercial, but that would, that was a whole nother discussion and not yeah. the path to go down. So it's, it's so that, that particular to me. <laughs> parcel, the, the newer building, I think it's the Ridge, it's neighborhood commercial R14. That's, mm -hmm. that's the actual zoning. Correct. It's split zoned. 
Yeah, slash Art 14. And we also noted in the December workshop that the city sensitive use buffer of 900 feet is at our discretion. That was what the council decided. Should that decision be ever overruled, the buffers would obviously change and other potential NC locations might open up. But under the existing 900 foot city and 600 foot state, these are the two parcels we're talking about. But the, the and and we did discuss um, what this council believes, and we and I understood that a future council, 10, 15, 20 years from now, can make a different decision. But um, we've gone through the process of um, the buffer that we have and our our, well, can I, our environmental can I, study. Can I, pa can I pause this for a second? Because um, we heard that um, from Sandy. I think we need to hear the speakers uh, before we continue in discussion. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe hold on a sec there. Um, you guys don't want to hear the speakers. Not, <laughs> not quite yet. I, I mean, the whole premise behind this was there were several parcels, and this was going to actually right. provide maybe some solutions for other other locations off of several parcels. Um, with that in mind, I thought maybe it would be worth the staff time to rewrite this because there's going to be more work that has to be done with the zoning in order for this to even happen in the future. Uh, as part of this ordinance, with it being literally just now this one parcel, I don't know that it's it's worth it's worth the time, uh, staff time to to even deal with this at this point. Um, so I, I don't I don't know. Is that where you were going as well? So this may be. Let's let's make this. So perhaps this is a moot point if we're kind of in consensus there. We got at least three so far. That are kind of shaking heads that. Oh, we them, we have speaker slips on the table here. We need to hear from the public. We do. I just if, want to make sure. Unless they decline to, to, to speak, right? Yes. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want everybody here. I think where we're going is probably to remove this section and just move forward with what the original ordinance had stated. Does that sound about right? Okay. For me, for me as well. Call speakers. First speaker I have is Truth. Sounds a little bit like the public comment is moot at this point. Oh, man. I'm, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Okay, one. Let's see. I, I wrote one. This is, I'm supposed to say this part first because I wrote it. Uh, I, I, it shouldn't be any surprise to anybody that I'm, I'm the one who was stuck in the middle on the items <laughs> being separated. I don't, know, I don't know what I wrote about. I don't know what I'm going to speak about. Manufacturing or whatever this is about. I don't even know because it's all moot anyways. And uh, let's see, uh, I wanted to thank Pittman because your explanation was very good because I'm actually worse than Laura on this topic. I'm a, I'm, I live a straight edge lifestyle. And for those who don't know that, that's no smoking, no drinking, no drugs. Proud of it. Um, although it does, usually straight edge means you, you listen to hardcore punk, which is okay, but I, I, I like to know the lyrics. Okay, I'm, I'm curious, how, how did you guys come up with a number of four cannabis businesses? I don't really know. Uh, I like that the city has a reservation of rights, kind of like stores with a sign that says we, refuse, we reserve the right to refuse service. Uh, I'm curious how the criminal background check will detect and prevent political criminals, like the cannabis Cardenas, who funneled money to many political campaigns. Um, how come the area around the sheriff's department is not zoned for cannabis businesses? Because that would get rid of Ron's ALPR dreams. Plus, there's already 24-hour cameras required. Um, here's a fun joke. Is it possible to increase the 600-900 uh, foot buffer zone to cover the distance of the whole city? That's, that's an option, you know. Maybe a future council will consider that. And the mosquitoes, the high-frequency devices to deter vandals and loiters, I don't think that's going to deter anybody. Uh, especially not burglars, they're still going to break in. They're just going to bust whatever that device is. And uh, I think it's strange that a cannabis business can't even show on its sign what kind of business it actually is or what they even sell. What's, what's the point of having the business if you can't advertise it? And the community benefit aspect, you know, that's great if they want to voluntarily give. Uh, but uh, if it's not voluntary, if it's a requirement, then you're, they're basically paying tribute to do business. They already get taxed a lot to the point that I don't even 
see how it's how it's possible to have one of these businesses and function because the the taxes are in the and permits are like in the tens and tens of thousands. I don't know how any of them stay open. There must be a lot of addicts or something. That includes my comments. Thank you. Next speaker I have is Dan Bickford. I my time. Next speaker I have is Matthew Jones. Good evening, Council. My name is Matthew Jones, and I'm here on behalf of Off the Charts to learn more about the commercial cannabis application process in Santee. Our hope is that the city enacts a just process that is deferential to operators with proven cannabis industry experience, exemplary ownership qualifications, and a record of compliance with local and state agencies. We also hope that the city will take into account local ties to the community. Given our business operations, and experience in San Diego County over the last five years. We look forward to the city's official announcement of an application process and the potential of being substantial contributors to Santee's business community. Thank you. The next speaker, um, trying to read the writing, it's Dev, Devin Julian. Good evening, Council, uh, staff, and community. Devin Julian with Culture Cannabis Club. I appreciate your time this evening. Um, I came today to speak on the neighborhood commercial items specifically um, due to a property that I thought had zoned. And based on the current map that was shown uh, recently, it looks like it does. But staff is saying that there's only two parcels uh, that do and not um, specifically the 11541 Woodside Ave property, um, which we've been uh, uh, working on um, uh, getting approved or getting a nod from the city on whether it is approved or not. Um, my comments may be moot uh, based on uh, staff's presentation, or I would ask that perhaps that's double-checked to make sure that that's the case. But um, my comments are that uh, at the last meeting, um, it was spoken about saying just change the zoning of that property specifically to general commercial. I just wanted to remind um, uh, the council that uh, to change the zone of a property takes a vote of the people because of um, Prop N, I believe, in 2020, and we've been working through staff with that uh, option. Um, I do believe that it is part consistent with the neighborhood commercial uh, designation of day-to-day -day transaction to the uses, especially for those medical customers, of which we do have several that come in um, uh, every day or every other day, similar to what they would do in other neighborhood commercial businesses, such as grocery stores, liquor stores, and um, tobacco shops. Um, uh, and you are all you are maintaining all the buffer zones throughout the city, so there's no concerns with um, going against what the buffer zones in the city are. So um, those were my reasons for uh, wanting to ask for your support for adding neighborhood commercial. The final one was that there's already um, going to be a potential uh, amendment to the ordinance as you gave direction to staff on the manufacturing, so this wouldn't delay or alter the process since both of those would could be presented to. Um, the council uh, at a future meeting um, to be considered after uh, the process. Um, so uh, in conclusion, I would just ask that perhaps staff can take a look at that parcel again, the 11541 Woodside Avenue, and see if it qualifies, because based on our analysis, it does. Um, secondly, uh, ask for support in at least um, considering the neighborhood commercial amendment to the ordinance, since you already are considering an amendment to that ordinance. It doesn't slow things down. And then lastly, I just want to say thank you. Uh, I'm born and raised here in San Diego, or in Santee, um, went to West Hills, class of 05. Uh, I want to say thank you to staff for being so helpful and to the council for um, being careful and calculated as you consider a cannabis ordinance here in my hometown where my parents still live. My four-week-old baby is up with my parents right now as I drove down from my home and, um, and hanging out with my three-and-a-half-year-old. So it's very important to me that this is done right, it's done safely, um, and Culture Cannabis Club is looking forward to being part of the, of the business community, whether it's at this location or others. Thank you for your time. Next speaker is Cameron Pittman. I didn't have anything on the commercial neighborhood. Should I wait, or is this all right, the time to do that now? No, we're calling for all of them. Okay, cool. Um, so I just want to pull this up real quick. We, you are talking about clarification. Cameron, just, just to clarify, you can talk about anything on this item, cannabis-related, yep. other than manufacturing. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I'm not trying to talk about that. Yep. You can um, related to it. So we have a clarification about draft procedures. Um, we talked about uh, 
clarifying the the merit based system and and whether or not some of these points are are weighted. Is there a rubric? Um, uh, how are we going to decide? Is it is it all or nothing in terms of these points? Um, it's not very clear there. I, I don't believe in the application process around that. Um, it just says this is the amount of points you will be awarded for each of these categories. Um, again, I, is it all or nothing? Could I earn 300 of that? Or, you know, is it 450? So I would just maybe clarify around that. Uh, otherwise, it might be some arbitrary, oh, I want to put 200 down for this one and 300 down for this one and 450 for this one, even if they all maintain and have the same things around them. So, so that, that would be one thing I, I think that uh, we should look at. Also, when it, when, when it says that we're coming back to the council as the final process, um, it doesn't specify whether that is a unanimous vote, whether that's two-thirds vote. Um, if one person says no, does that mean it, it, it doesn't happen? Uh, I think there should probably be some clarification around that, um, just so that way, uh, as they're going through the process, it's a little more clear. Uh, when we talk about parking, parking requirements, I, I think that's important. That's something I brought, I continuously bring up. Um, I would also, uh, you know, look at uh, public transportation uh, within that area. Uh, somebody mentioned previously, uh, the whole reason we even have this ordinance is because it was built on the backbone of medical patients, uh, people who, who need this in order to survive uh, or have a better quality of life. And uh, a lot of those patients use public transportation. Um, and so if we are concerned or, or trying to keep those people in mind, uh, not only parking should be a part of that criteria, but I also think access or closeness to um, some sort of public transportation should should be something that's included within that that topic. Thank I have you. a question on that. Um, yeah. Do you guys do deliveries out of your businesses or so I I, I particularly do not have a, a cannabis uh, retail or any sort of license like that. I, I, I represent brands so I, I work with manufacturers ideally to bring their products to the retailers. Um, so we have um, MTS has two bus routes. One goes from um, Trolley Square up to basically West Hills and back. The other goes from Trolley Square up to um, here, just b below here, and then back. So there are no bus routes that I know of that go over in that area at all, and where we were talking about. So those would, there's really hard to. Well, I, I I'm, and I think we're talking about all you know. Now there's there's multiple locations right not just the neighborhood locations i don't know if any of those other yeah, uh, the, the the ordinance allows general commercial light industrial and in, 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 within throughout the city correct. obviously lonzo fits within the buffer yeah and so i'm just saying if, if we're going to pick one or the other if, the, if there's one that's a little bit closer to some sort of public transportation stop uh you know that should be considered in in that thank you mr Pittman. yeah the last speaker i have is luis iriuarte <laughs> the way I pronounced his that. name. Yeah. Uh, hello, Honorable Council. Uh, my name is Luis Ituarte. Uh, um, I'm here on behalf of Wellgreens Dispensary. Um, we're really excited and, and we're eagerly awaiting the launch of the cannabis program here in Santee. Uh, our owner operators, Besma and Sam, uh, along with myself, have deep roots in East County. Thus, the opportunity to apply for a dispensary here in Santee's, you know, holds sentimental value for us. So we're really excited. Uh, in your previous discussions, you astutely highlighted non-payment of bills as a critical issue within our industry. So we would fully support implementing some sort of credit worthiness assessment, similar to what uh, other brands and distributors are, are applying to identify whether they want to work with retailers or not. Um, additionally, we advocate for stronger emphasis on parking within the evaluation criteria. Uh, allocating extra points for ad adequate parking would, you know, mitigate neighborhood disruptions and uh, make sure the business operates more orderly. Furthermore, I, I, I would urge the council to consider incentives for local ownership, uh, supporting you know, family-oriented, locally-rooted businesses as opposed to large 
external uh, conglomerates, um, you know, businesses that align with our community's values, and uh, you know, this would bolster local economic development. Um, uh, lastly, we strongly recommend against uh, allowing multiple operators to apply for a single location. I know we discussed that last time. Uh, given the plan to only give out four licenses, uh, it's plausible that the top applicants might choose the same, the same property. The prime property, the, obviously the property is going to have something to do with how many points they get. So that's very feasible. Um, and you know, this could then result in a situation where you're either forced to award a license to a less qualified applicant, um, which might invite litigation, or ask a higher scoring applicant to relocate, which might be unfair since their score, like I mentioned, is based on their, on their location. Uh, or you could have a scenario where fourth and fifth place uh, are tied in score and applied in the same property, and deciding who gets it might, might get a little, a little tricky and get litigious. Um, so anyway, limiting applications to one per location would streamline the process and minimize potential legal disputes. Okay, thank you for your time. No further speakers, sir. Sandy, do you have anything else to add to, to the item? I was going to mention next steps if you would like to hear that. So if directed by city council to make ordinance changes, which we have been now, and assuming no additional CEQA review, staff would return. Oh, yeah, were you okay? Sorry, staff will return on February 14th, 2024 for consideration. City Council would separately review the draft application process in the spring. We are already working with the Sheriff's Department to secure the memorandum of understanding for background verifications uh, services, and we'll be soliciting proposals for the appeals hearing officer. That concludes my presentation. Councilman Hall, you, you were in the queue, or is that from something earlier, or is that? You guys have anything else? Well, I'll say what. So, I'm, when, when we wrote this ordinance, we, just like a few people mentioned, we were very stringent in how we did this. We exceeded the state um, mandates, guidelines in a lot of cases. Uh, we were very thoughtful on how we put this ordinance together here for the city of Santee so we can protect our community. And one of the items before us tonight was the neighborhood commercial consideration. We excluded it uh, back then, and I'm still against uh, adding it into here. You know, we, all our reasons are well documented. Previously, we didn't go back to it. So, I, again, I'm when, with you guys. I, I'm not in favor of adding neighborhood commercial into the, to the zoning options. I'm, I'm fine with that as well at this, at this point. <laughs> um, but I think we're... We're on track with everything else. Uh, do we? Yeah, we'll. we'll you, you see the consensus that have we given staff the direction needed to move forward? Yes, we we have the direction on the the first part, and we'll bring that back. Um, and we have the direction on neighbor commercial. We will table that. We will not bring that back uh, to you. And the rest is as kind of as written. Um, yeah, the, the, no other changes to the ordinance. Um, obviously, we heard some good feedback today yeah. on the procedures. We can take those into account. Um, we're going to bring those back to you. Get, get, hopefully, they'll be teed up for your approval. But again, you, know, you, you can uh, tweak them. Um, I think we were looking for some direction, if, if you want to give it now, on that last point about... The address? You know, yeah, I mean, we have I one. Know. You know, so it's a tough one because you know, I think... Sandy can speak to it, but the you know, the idea was if we only you know if we if there are fewer locations that are available, do you want to have the ability for to see multiple applications or two applications at least for the same property, so you can get a range of different providers? Um, that's the way the procedures are currently written, and then you've, you've heard a comment today and, and previously that that may create issues. We, we kind of need some direction on that, but that's something you can table until we bring the procedures back if you don't want to weigh into it tonight. It is a sticky wicket. Yeah, I, I think probably maybe individually we or maybe at the subcommittee, subcommittee. we need to yeah. talk this through a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. Yeah. 
I agree with that. Okay, okay. so that we can bring back uh, to the subcommittee sort of all of these issues, get some final direction from yeah. the subcommittee, and then bring the whole procedures back. I agree with that, because that way you guys have a chance to hash it out with the yeah. subcommittee. The mayor will be back at that time. <laughs> can, can My money's on Laura. Finalize the, app <laughs> <laughs> finalize the application process from there. So. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> all right, direction given to staff, so we're done with that item. So new business, item number six. Or call the item. Pavement maintenance workshop fiscal year 2024-25 and finding the action is not a project subject to the California Environmental Quality Act, CEQA. Carl? Good evening, Vice Mayor and City Council. Um, Staff is here to kind of present a little bit of history on pavement management here at the city, where we've been, some of the pavement management recommendations, and, sorry. And talk a little bit about what some of our recommendations are into the future, and, and we're gonna try and seek a little bit of more input from city council as well on funding and maybe some future priorities council may have. So I want to talk just briefly a little bit about our payment management program and, and a little bit of summary. So if council remembers, back in uh, 2022, we gave a, a pretty lengthy presentation on the payment management report at, in a workshop at that point, and council indicated they'd like to have a workshop every year. So that's why we're here again today. Um, a couple of things we want to talk about is funding, and payment management, as we know, is the analysis, programming, all these things that we do to try and get maximum benefit for the money we have allocated, programmed, budgeted, and everything. In particular, two of the funding sources, Transnet and SB1, RMRA, gas tax, a lot of acronyms, um, road maintenance, recovery account. Those funds have very specific requirements for reporting. We have to um, do that reporting a year in advance. We come to city council. You may have seen those before where we have to ask for your recommendations and approvals. We report on them. Then the following year, we start utilizing that funding. Um, the report, what it does is within that report, it identifies the streets that I mentioned, and it's based on a like a pavement condition and a, of a network analysis. We try to do work that's consistent in certain neighborhoods and certain zones and different types of strategies. Again, so we get the most bang for the buck, so we can do as much as we can with the money that's allocated. And as you know, we're always asking for more money. Um, that's just what we do. But. Um, let's talk a little bit about the annual funding for um, the surfacing that we've done. Um, the 22 report, um, at that time, we only had Transnet and RMRA and projecting it out into future years, it was about $2.8 million was allocated at that time. And that was kind of the amount estimated to be, keep a current PCI of a 65. 65 is not ideal. Um, it's less than perfect. Um, we'd like to get to a PCI of 70. 70 is ideal so we can get into a maintenance application process where we're not having to reconstruct streets every year. To get to that point, we've estimated we need about $4.5 million each year for the next five years to get us to that point. We've made some great strides getting there, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that funding that council has allocated to help get us there. Um, in the history of Santee, you know, from 20, uh, 2000 and to 2021, um, when we really started working on payment management, our first payment manager report was actually 1998. That was when it really became a requirement for funding, but it really started taking off in, in 2002. At that time, we were averaging over those, those years from 2002 to 21, $1.5 million. To give you a feel for how much that actually got done, that was about 23 streets per year, and we have approximately 507 streets. They're not all the same, they're different sizes, but just to give you scope and feel. So with the payment management report in 2022, city council listened to us and they were, we, we had some funding and it was allocated and we got an additional 4.13 on top of what our average funding we were getting from Transnet and RMRA and that was from the general fund. You know, That was the first time city council had ever had some of those surplus money and dedicated them after that payment management report realizing we need to do a little bit more. At the subsequent meeting during some of the paving, an ARPA money became available during COVID and an additional $1 million was allocated. And I'll get into a little bit about what we were able to accomplish with all that additional funding. So with that, the average annual street surfacing contract for 22 when we began with all that extra funding and 2023 
was 4.7 million per year. What that allowed us to do on average was 48 streets per year if that funding continues, just in rough numbers. So talking about the 22 through 24 general fund and ARPA funding, um, that 4.4 million of the total 5.15 that was allocated over those last two years, we intended to spend all of that money. However, you know, during this last contract, um, we still have a carryover of, of uh, seven, $710,000, and it was primarily because one of the uh, bid items had an exorbitantly high price during that bid. We tried to negotiate with the contractor, decided, hey, it's not worth moving forward with that. Let's get another contract out to bid in this fiscal year so we can, you know, keep on those plans to try and get this money spent and get these streets fixed as soon as we could. So right now, we actually have an item out for bid, and it includes two priority streets, and I'll, I'll explain those in a minute, that we're actually out to bid right now, that we're part of that original plan that we didn't accomplish over the summer because of those bad pricing. Wouldn't call them bad, just felt inflated, so we're trying to negotiate the best deal we could get. So in fiscal year 22 through 24, 20 of the 97 streets that we did resurface in those two years since we got all that additional funding, um, we're done out of the total 90 street, 97 streets in total. And that was, again, was just general fund and the ARPA funding. That doesn't include uh, the traditional uh, gas tax and, um, and transnet funding. I know you guys like maps. I think this really kind of puts it in perspective what we've accomplished since that payment manager report and that first real big workshop. Um, I know it's a lot on here and it's hard to see, but um, generally what's shown in black, that's the stuff that's traditional. That's um, our transnet and gas tax, or RMRA, um, that's what we would have accomplished without all the additional funding that was allocated. What's in blue, pink, and, and red, that's all the additional streets, and those were primarily streets identified by city council in workshops or at city council meetings in those previous workshops as priorities and things that they've identified along with some of the staff's recommendations. So. You know, you can see we've got a lot of stuff going on here, and there's been a lot of construction going on in Santee the last two years, and, and we've made a really big impact, I think, on improving the quality of these streets for the residents. Um, kind of even taking a little step further, putting it in perspective, the impact that that had, uh, all that additional funding, it, it's just kind of a graph chart. And, you know, there's a lot of information here again, but just to try and demonstrate in 2020, Here's kind of the funding we spent and a breakdown. You know, you can see the colors. The total amount in green was, the, was what we spent. And then obviously the biggest year we've ever had in our history, which was a tremendous workload for staff and pretty overworked to get all that work done. And, and it was a lot of extra hours and nights and weekends and lots of things. We got up to, you know, a little over $5 million. But what's important to note is what we're kind of showing in, in red. That represents... Um, some of the funding that has been allocated that council has thrown at projects um, to help get us much greater funding in total. And for 22 and 23, that was a pretty big impact. We have a little bit of carry forward right now, but right now we currently have no additional funding programmed in uh, 25, 26 general fund or ARPA. Um, we understand that and that'll be part of uh, some of this discussion. We're gonna ask for input and recommendations from council moving forward. Um, again, a lot of a lot of information, but um, the falling streets that we were identified as priority streets by city council, and again as recommended by staff, is where we've gotten a lot of complaints and we've had a lot of issues and concerns from residents. Um, this is what we were able to complete in those years. This is just a list of those streets, and I'll show you on a map again, uh, break down a little bit more detail of what was accomplished with those. So it is a lot of work that's been done in all those priority streets. This is the ones that are remaining that council has identified that were priorities. And again, I had mentioned before um, what's shown here in blue, and it's Fenita Drive and Mission Gorge. These were priority streets. Right now, what we're recommending or what we're going to come back to city council with, with uh, an award here in the next month or so, is an award to uh, a contract recommendation for award for doing the patching. And what that's going to allow us to do is get that work done in the wintertime. Hopefully we can get some favorable bids because most of the paving happens in the summer and it'll help relieve staff of all that heavy workload in the summer with all that work, with having to work nights and weekends, primarily because Mission Gorge Road, we have to do night work and it's hard to do night work and day work 
at the same time because we're stretched with staff and having to split them up. So um, that was recommended by <laughs> our, our paving expert down here, Toby, because he had to do a lot of those nights and weekends. And he came to me and Steve and he said, I'd like to do this. And we said, let's do it. And we approached the manager and she said, yeah, let's get these priorities done as fast as we could. So out of the remaining priorities that were already identified that we've talked about, we still have Carlton Oaks, Cuyamaca Street, Mission Gorge, and Prospect Avenue. Um, right now, there's not currently any funding. The 710 carryover is going to be expended, is planning to be expended, and if it comes in favorably, we'll complete the patching on Finita and Mission Gorge Road. Um, so kind of the map that we talked about, um, we talked about all those priority streets. Again, this is just more of a blow up of all these priority streets and the impact that all that additional funding has had. Um, everything in blue, those are what's been completed. Um, what's in pink right now, Mission Gorge Road, a section kind of post office, Carlton Hills over towards Town Center Parkway, um, and Finita Drive, which was also identified. Those are the ones that are going to be coming back in a month or so. And what's in red are the remaining streets in our priority list. So kind of switching gears now, that's kind of the history we've had with pavement. This is what we're talking about kind of moving forward. So again, this doesn't mean a lot to you guys. You've seen these zone maps and things and we've talked about them, but what I just wanted to demonstrate is these, this is a list, this, this list here. These are all the zones that were recommended in the pavement management report. We've completed several of them and we have programmed in this year to do several more. But we want to point out within that payment management report, we try to stick to it the best we can because that's the best bang for the buck. And council gave us some clear direction on a couple of the zones, um, I believe it was two years ago, um, was zone FF and zone DD and zone FD. Um, zone FD is just one street on Rockville. There's a potential development. We don't want to go pave a street with a potential development there. Um, the other two zones, one of them, uh, DD is the Wheatlands neighborhood, heavy industrial, lots of things going on there. Uh, we kind of agree, let's get more bang for our buck on the residentials and the high traffic streets because the resident, uh, the, you know, the industrial takes a beating on them. And zone FF was a small little area over in an industrial over by, um, Kenny Street, Railroad Avenue over there, same kind of feeling. And council said, hey, let's spend it, let's get our bang for our buck with that money somewhere else. So here's kind of the recommendations we have, and we call it fiscal year 24, 25, because the work actually happens in the summer and the bills and everything come in into the next fiscal year. So that's, it, it might get a little confusing because we talk calendar year, we talk fiscal year, those crossover, paving happens in both, but the bulk of the expenditures happen in the next fiscal year because we start the work in the summer. So here's kind of a list, the remainder of zone AE, Hal Burns Boulevard. We did some of that already. Um, remainder of zone BG, which is primarily 2nd Street. Remainder of zone EC, Maricall Lane. Um, again, and we waited on that one because of all the construction going on in that neighborhood at that time. I think we're confident now all that construction is done. And now as the work goes to the, to the south, uh, hopefully what we all combine will be complete when that work is done. Uh, zone AH, zone BA, and I'll show you these on a map here in a minute because it's hard to understand where they're at. Uh, Finita Drive, again, it's um, Mission Gorge Road um, from Prospect Avenue. And again, this is the follow-up from the patching we're currently bidding, and this is going to do a, a surface treatment on top of it, part two. We found it's better to bid the contract as a whole do a separate just asphalt contract, and then combine it with our slurry seal contract to do the final treatment rather than one bidder. And then some crack sealing and then Prospect Avenue from Atlas View Drive to Cuyamaca Street. And again, these are primarily recommended within the payment management report and then the follow up with some of the priority locations that council primarily Mission Gorge Road completing that. So here's kind of a map showing you, here's zone BA. Uh, zone AH, Zone BG, which is 2nd Street, Zone FI, it's kind of the northern part of um, Shadow Hill Park area, uh, Prospect Avenue right here, um, Fanita Drive, which we're going to, like I said, we're going to do the patching right now, hopefully, uh, CG, Mission Gorge Road, and Zone AE. So with that, that kind of concludes my presentation with this exciting subject of paving. 
you know, we're just kind of right now um, asking council to support and approve what the recommendations are in the payment management report using the current annual Transnet and RMRA uh, program funds, which are, remind you, are already programmed with the state and with SANDAG. And then provide direction to staff um, on any priority streets you have that we can resurface and talk about funding for future years. And I, I think it's important timing wise, we'll be coming with a mid-year budget and that'll be the time to look at if funding is available or can be allocated, we can take any priority streets that you have this fiscal year, look at that funding when it's available and potentially come back next year with some priority streets given the available funding, picking the streets that work with the funding that's available. And with that, that concludes our presentation. <laughs> Sorry, I had to dive into my inner John O'Donnell. For those who remembered, I, I was told I needed to liven these presentations up a little bit, so I know it's a dull subject. <laughs> Any speaker slips, City Clerk? Yes, one speaker, Truth. You know, don't worry, Carl. That was actually a roller coaster presentation. I was listening because uh, I, I, it was like okay, getting kind of boring, and then it was like, ooh, Sandak. Oh, you just lost me. I'm sick. I don't want to support this item at all anymore. And then you liven it up at the end and see it. It worked. Um, but I got news for you. you. Said you were talking about, um, you know, that's what we do. We look for money. But I got news for you. Every person in government does nothing but ask or demand for more and more money. Uh, so you're not alone. And the fraud emergency that resulted in all that money upended people's lives. ARPA, American Ruination Plan Act, that actually ends in December. So that's, that money's going to be gone. I hope you're not counting on it. Unless all of a sudden another emergency just blows in, you can declare one for anything in these days. And the money just gets funneled and you never know where it ends up. Um, but what I originally wrote is, I'm pretty sure this is Dustin's dreams coming to fruition. There's no flowers or anything in it. This is great. Um, and it's, I, think it, I think it was $4.5 million needed every year, which that's a crazy amount. It's not too bad. And, of course, the price is going to go up with inflation. It'll be, it'll be $10 million before you know it. Um, but just a comparison, I'm pretty sure the city of San Diego um, requires, like, billions. <laughs> so, they, actually, they actually had years where they put $0 to street repair. They're such fools. And their mayor made baseless, broken promises about how the streets are going to get fixed. And I won't repeat his line here. I, everyone should know that stupid line he always says. Um, my only argument to this item is why not repairs on Mast Boulevard or Cuyamaca Street? Maybe that's already in the, in the works. I don't know because I'm not back there. All the secret conspiratorial plans. No, I'm just kidding. But I think it should be because I, I look at it and I'm... It's a disappointment. I've seen worse, though. Don't get me wrong. I've seen way worse. Like, you go to City Heights. What, what an embarrassment. I even heard some, um, there's some street closures that are happening here, too. I heard at the county for a year and a half. And I heard on the news people were asking why. And I know, I know why here. It's for safety. I remember hearing that. But some lady asked, what are they, why, why do we need it? I don't think it's for safety in particular. I think it was Corey Road she was asking about. And she asked... On TV, she said, what are they doing with all our taxes? And, of course, my reaction is, man, if only she knew. I know exactly what they're doing. But anyways, um, the other point would be, uh, are you guys going to get one of those companies John was describing that pave as well as they do on the East Coast? Because if not, we're just going to slip and slide on that slurry like tends to happen on some of these streets. Anyways, I'm actually in approval. Thank you. Any other speakers? No further speakers, sir. Councilman Hall. Truth stole my uh, my uh, ideas. Um, I, the Mass Boulevard um, between Queen Mac and Magnolia. Um, I know they're putting a water line in there. Is the JPA going to cover any of that? And how much can we? Yeah. So the reason why we're not doing Mast is because, um, for, and for the audience, for council, the the um, advanced water pur purification problem is actually running right down Mast, and they're going to start construction here very quick. In fact, we'll be giving some announcements in the next few weeks. You've already seen some of it down towards Los Ranchitos and in the intersection of Magnolia. Again, we don't want to spend money while construction is happening on paving. So when they're done, they will be doing restorations. 
as required in our in our ordinances and codes and in our in our encroachment permits. So once they're done, then we'll look at allocating on on mast. Okay, and do we are they just from what I understand they're just going to go one lane, two lanes, or it, it it goes one lanes crosses a little bit, two lanes, then it switches to the other side. Right. But again, they're going to be running equipment, excavators, loaders, lots of big heavy equipment through, and you know. Again, I don't want to put a brand new paving there and then have people no, come to us and say, what are you guys aren't not planning? You're letting these guys tear it up. So, you know, we try to consciously look at land development projects and future projects, and we meet with the utilities regularly to try and plan these out. Okay. So it's, we don't so do those basically, what do you think they're going to be responsible for? I think that gets to the question that I'm looking for. What was that again? What what are they going to pave when they're done, and what are we going um, to pave? They're going to they're going to pave everything they damage. It's primarily we require them to do. A, if they touch a lane, they have to replace the whole lane. If they go within three feet of a curb, they have to take it to the curb. Okay. So we have some very stringent requirements, and we've worked really hard through the years to try and toughen up our encroachment permits and our standard drawings for how we do it. And I, in my opinion, um, I, we, I think we've seen some better results with some of the strategies we've been using with the trenches and how they're holding up better than how things were done in the past. It's not perfect, but um, you know we'll we'll be holding holding their feet to the fire to make sure. And we and and, and our, my engineer Steve Miller meets with them every two weeks. We go through it with them. Um, we're meeting with them tomorrow to talk about some of these things as well. Okay. Um, the other one that I was looking at is um, Mass Boulevard at Cuyamaga. Uh, I think it might be on there, but I'm not really Can we go to the ones we're planning on doing or anything? Okay, that's not helpful, but um, I think it is on. The, do we have a list of the streets that we're planning on? Um, right here? That one, yeah. So, so, well, the other one I'm talking about is for Mass Boulevard. Pretty on, much all the way down to Home Depot. On Cuyamaca? Yeah, on Cuyamaca. Uh, we've done the, the first half, so we need to look at maybe doing the... It's just terrible. Um, Mission Gorge in front of the post office, obviously, is another one. Hal Burns we're doing. I was driving by there today, and uh, just to make sure I did some driving around to make, to make sure. Um, Northwood side we're holding off on, and hopefully when they build that warehouse where the drive-in is, maybe we can get some money for paving down that area, too. And then the, the bottom half of North Dakota, that's the one that I was talking about earlier with you. Um, that's kind of, that general area there, I would like to look into because it's, uh, it ain't any better on the south end as, or the north end as it is the south end. So it would be good to have those in. Other than that, I think we're, we're moving on. Okay. Okay. Um. So how did Mission Gorge hold up after these rains? Any? Um, you know, we have a little bit of mulch and debris and stuff deposited, but uh, as far as the paving, I, I, from what we saw, it's fine. Okay. I mean, I know it's a rough area between, um, like, the post office to, you know, well, that's and, and that's zoned. We're to taking be, care of that. Taking care of that. Good, because obviously traffic is likely to increase even more there. Um, one area that I'd like staff to look at is um, on Mission Gorge um, going west. So I guess it's a little west of Meadowbrook. I think it's kind of fine to Meadowbrook, but then up to Highlands. <laughs> um, that's pretty rough, and there's a lot of traffic that goes Honestly, on. that's been on our list, but with all the development going over there, yeah. the Pier Flow site, um, Laurel Heights, all the stuff on Maricol Lane, and we've been tapping into those streets with utilities. Again, also with the gas station, the subway. Everything. Everything going on. There's yeah. a lot going on, and again, as they tap into utilities and other things and do trenching, you, you know, we're trying to make conscious decisions to not tear those up, but that has definitely been high on our priority, and we do get a lot of complaints in that location. Well, glad it's on your radar. So do I. <laughs> uh, for me, it's just, you know, it's the neighborhoods. It's some of these neighborhood streets that still haven't been paved in 25, 30 years. Um, driving around the neighborhood, especially in my district, uh, just alligators popping out of the asphalt, all over the place, weeds coming out of the asphalt on the streets. Uh, you know, kids can't play football in the streets anymore. They can't ride their 
bikes or skateboards in the streets um, because it's <laughs> the wheels won't turn on them. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not safe. It's um, you know, I, I understand the major thoroughfares. They are the major thoroughfares, and as such, need to be the the priority. But guys, we got to continue to look at our neighborhoods as well. Um, it's it's pride of ownership when your when your house is you know you, you've spent a lot of money on your home and to make it look nice and 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 stick up in your neighborhood, but your street is tore up from the floor up in front of you. It's just uh, these are these are still some of the priorities that we need to do, and there's a lot of them in my district that just haven't been touched some almost ever. So I really would like to see us looking at that as well. Yeah, duly, duly noted. So I'll start there, actually. So I don't know, Toby, it might be probably easier for you to come up here with the uh, pavement book we have here, pavement condition zones. <laughs> probably easier for you to explain to the public and us. <laughs> so I, I actually had the same, some, a similar concern. I'll talk about a couple other streets here in a second. We've done an amazing job tackling some of the poor and marginal uh, neighborhoods in the last uh, couple years, and obviously extra funds hitting some of the major artillery roads and, you know, the, the thoroughfares, like Rob said. But can you give us a – I know this is a five-year paving program, right, that we're working within, right? right? So that's years 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. Correct. Okay. So we're in 24 right now? Yes. Okay. So can you tell us what neighborhood zones are being done in 24, which I think, Carl, you've already mentioned in the one slide um, – over here, right? Um, it's not this. Well, A H B A and F I. Those are not. Um, can you go back, Carl? There was there was one where you had a. Those are the zones and streets we will be resurfacing this summer. Okay. So those are those are the ones completed. These uh, the one. Go back one, Carl, please. Right there. So this is this coming summer. Correct. So A, H, B, A, and F, I are the neighborhood zones. And then completion of the, the other ones, basically, because they're, they're mostly done. Correct. Okay. So what about zones A, B, A, G, and B, H? Let's start there. <clears throat> what year? He's going to have to tell you what neighborhoods, because they don't have a map for this available, right? I'm assuming. That's correct. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just too hard for such a small scale to have all these zones on one right. big map. <clears throat> Zone AB is the Medina Drive neighborhood north of Mast Boulevard. Pebble Beach Boulevard, and everything Pebble north Beach of Mast, yes. Long Santee Lakes. That area, correct. Okay. That is listed the fourth zone after we complete this year's program <clears throat> in the report. So it will be 25? It will likely be started in 25 based on what funding we may have, yes. Sure, of course. Understood. Okay. The next one was... AG. AG is... <clears throat> North of Mass Boulevard, west of Carlton Hills Boulevard, Lake Hill Road, Lake Country Drive, Darrell Road. Mm -hmm. That area is set for crack fill with the current contract out this summer, so that will be third on the list according to the report and that's likely to be started in 2025 based on funding of course again okay. uh bh bh is north of mast boulevard clary street green castle grand fork los ranchitos columbus bend street area Zone BH is actually the second zone that's on the list according to the 22 report. B, B, H. and Boy, H, and Henry. And that's the second zone according to the pavement management report. So that will likely also be started in 2025 again based on funding. Okay, so you guys, the reason why I looked at this, looking at the map, these are the poor and marginal neighborhoods within our communities. So you're identifying this second, third, and fourth Coming. After this yeah, year's After this cycle, program. right, yes. correct. All right, so the next three are FB. FB 
be is probably, it looks like there's four neighborhoods that are in advance of that one, according to our latest report. So this is Shadow Hill, North Coat, all those neighborhoods and streets in there, yeah? Yeah, yeah right, right here yes. on the map, it's kind of where I'm showing the arrow. It's this mm -hmm. neighborhood right here. Yes. It's the ones I was talking about. Yes, so correct. Yes. So I'm sorry, was that fifth in the order? Is so there's, said? looks like fourth. four neighborhoods that are in advance, in advance of that. So AB is the fourth in the list. The zone you're talking about now is probably eight or nine. Okay. Um, F G. <clears throat> F G is Black Horse Estates uh, neighborhood. There's three streets in that neighborhood, and. It was this year. It's kind of right, right here on the map where I'm kind of showing. Mm -hmm. That's yes. where we're. Oh, right above just, where we're just, planning. Just south of where we're doing this this year. And that's also after Zone A B, the fourth one. There's four, five, or six neighborhoods that are in advance of that as well. Okay, and the last, the last one I have um, is B I. BI is the neighborhood from Wood Park Drive, north of El Nepal, south of Woodland Vista, all the way to Molino, Layerwood. Three um, Oaks. Three Oaks. Wood Cedar Park, Springs. Wood Rose. Yes, that, that neighborhood. Yeah, it's kind of right underneath uh, the zone AH on this map right in here. Mm -hmm. And that is probably number 10 or 11 on the list, according to the report. <laughs> okay. Ouch. Yeah, my neighbors are going to be dead before that gets done. <laughs> All right, so the reason why I bring it up, um, and thank you for Toby, is that I'm actually with Councilman Canellis, is that I, I really want these neighborhoods to be done as much as possible with the funding that we have and the additional funding we may have. Um, some of the major streets are extremely important, like Mission Gorge, Cuyamaca, um, especially, and then obviously big-time deferred streets like Prospect, Carlton Oaks and Finita that we have, but the neighborhoods are extremely important to, to our constituents here. So within the five-year program, um, but one additional street, which Councilman Hall kind of mentioned, um, in your additional streets you had, Carl, you had something about Cuyamaca from, um, I believe it's Mission Gorge to Riverview. Yeah, Cuyamaca Street from Mission Gorge Road to River River Park Drive. That's where the uh, yeah. sportsplex and all yeah, that is right, right there to the bridge to the San Diego River. So these four streets were previously identified as priority streets, but we have no funding for. Correct. That's correct. Okay. So uh, I see we have Cuyamaca, like I said, from Mission Gorge to River Park Drive. Um, have we done an assessment from River Park Drive up to Mass Boulevard? Because that's that's really bad going up that hill in front of the school and the school district. We, we might have an older one. We, we can get it to you quickly, but I don't think we have it with us today because that was one we were looking yeah. at as well. Yeah, I, I would like to add that one uh, personally as, as one of the major streets. Don't know if we have the funding for it, but I appreciate the look of what we talked about is kind of segmenting these improvements, right? We can't do the whole entire street in one, one swoop, but we can do it from a major intersection to a major, major intersection. So that, that's the only major street that I have other than the neighborhoods. And so kind of back to the funding, can you bring that one chart up real quick, Carl, and I'll wrap up here on this, the, the, the bar graph chart Okay. You had? So you guys can see, Carl did it here going back to 2020, and Council only allocated you know $1.1 $1 .1 million and then $2.3 million. We know today that $4.5 million is the magic number that we need for the next five years. We almost got there in 22, and 23, we actually exceeded that. So we, we were actually overfunded a little bit in that. And so we have a little bit of surplus carrying forward right now, that $710,000. We're still playing catch-up. And we're, st we're still playing catch-up. We're going to be playing catch-up. Yeah. But that's why I, um, I appreciate this chart showing that the next five years, you know, where we're at, 22, 23, 24, 25, 
of what we've already done, but we're still going to be deficient in the, the coming years if we don't allocate any general fund going forward in the budgets the, in the uh, coming the fiscal years. So in 24, we only have a, a shortfall of, you know, $500,000, which don't get me wrong, $500,000 is a lot of money, but that's a heck of a lot less than one, two and a half, four and a half million dollars that we've put forward too. So we're on to your point. I mean, every time that we, that we go yeah. deficient on that, it actually puts more cost into the future yeah. of, of, trying to get where we where we want to be so it is it, it needs to continue to be a priority for this council yep. i'm wrapped up are there any uh possible no, funds thank coming you, thank up you for the that? input and i think we'll be bringing it during the discussion during mid-year if there's discussion on that and funding allocated during those and in the end of the year budget for next year's budget um, you know, we'll try and have num we'll have numbers readily available for you guys then, and estimates for what we think these new priorities are, so that decisions can be discussed and made, and prioritize those. Because again, we got to match the funding to the strategy, to the location, and try and get the best bang for the buck with that as well. And in that, with the Mission Gorge to Highlands area, can you estimate when the construction in that general area would be done? Because most of it is wrapping up. There's just one project right now that's kind of in pre-app early application phase, the Purefo water site. Uh, Isn't there an AWP part of that segment? Yeah, sorry, in there too? correct. Oh, yeah, you're right. that's major. Yeah, <laughs> we have we haven't actually seen the the detailed plans. It's okay. in, it's still in planning. Steve's working with them on it. Steve, do you want to talk to him about that? Yeah, I actually had an email today. We're going to receive their sixty percent design submittal for final pipeline layout next week. So we'll take a look at that and see where the, the boring areas are going to be at and where the open cut trenching will have so a this better. is a part of the design that goes into Mission Trails. Yes. So where their existing pump station is adjacent to Highway 52 on ramp and um, 125, they're going to be taking a pipeline out of that and running west um, down Mission Gorge Road into the park. Yeah, and they go from there, they go into, just so the community knows, they go into the park at Old Mission Dam and go all the way down <laughs> Old Mission Dam through all the way through Mission Trails um, yeah. past to the other intermission trails. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. have a general idea too of where the trenching locations will be, but I, you know, we okay. want to make sure we see final designs until we commit a, a rebuild of Mission Gorge for the type of work that's going to be required on that area, especially west of West Hills Parkway, to get it done right. Right. Not only that, but um, just right now, the the turn lane, the right turn lane to get on the 52 is so torn up with them, oh with them yeah. doing you know their construction right now. So. Yeah, I no. don't want to throw good money at their no, at we, all. But. We agree, and we appreciate that you support that because, you know, that would be our recommendation as well. It's just it's not it's not a good idea to do that because once you cut into a street, the degradation happens quicker. We want a continuous mat, completed, finished street. You cut into it, and the trenches inherently, they're, they're not as good as a finished paving product. Could we ask them to fix some of those potholes they've created right in front of that sewer lift station? on Mission Gorge. If there's any potholes that are there remaining, we'll have, we'll have the inspection staff tomorrow double check on it. Okay. I do know that yesterday their contractor did go out and start patching immediately after the storm for some of the low spots. So they are aware of it and okay. we'll make sure we have our eyes on it. Carl, do you need a, a you, you have a recommendation on one? No, I, I think we're good enough as long as we got some direction moving forward and the funding will have to follow. And we'll be coming back um, with construction contracts, if you're okay with the rest of the neighborhoods we're moving forward and consistent, again, those are already programmed. And we'll be coming back to you in the next several months with next year's recommendations for Transnet and SB1 or RMRA gas tax because we have to start programming those as well. And we have to do an amendment to Transnet once new revenue projections come out any week now. So, so what is the SB1 funds again? Can you go back over that? Sorry, it's confusing. It's really I know, three I know acronyms. I they are, but I mean, what dollar-wise, what were they? Oh, the dollar amounts? All the, all the millions of dollars they guaranteed to give us. Um, it's on the chart right there. Oh. Yeah, right here. So there's the Transnet and RMRA. It's about $1 million a year. So, again, SB1, it was Senate Bill 1, and we call it RMA, it's Road Maintenance Recovery Account, but it's all part of the gas tax. It's funding generated from the taxes on gas. 
And then again, Transnet, to clarify, is the half-cent sales tax measure that's on all sales, goes directly into transportation. Anything else, guys? Nope. Okay. Uh, next item is not agenda uh, public comment continued. We have one speaker, Cameron Pittman. Hello. Uh, just want to talk about two things. Um, one being, since we've talked about cannabis, right, it's come up about protecting our youth and you know making sure we don't have access. As these businesses start to enter our community, I would like to urge you all to uh, maybe consider other businesses that are in our community that could be just as detrimental to our youth uh, and how we handle those businesses as well. Uh, liquor stores, uh, cigarettes, smoke shops. Uh, if we are going to uh, be a community that uh, touts that we are creating certain guidelines to uh, protect our youth, uh, we should do that across the board with all substances uh, that could be detrimental. Um, it, it was brought to my attention specifically because I live, uh, uh, you know, off of Palm Glen, and there's that liquor store that's right there, and they have about six bright yellow big flags uh, that say, get your cigarettes here, you know, very cheap, as cheap as they get, uh, you know, and it's catty corner to uh, high school. Uh, and so if we are going to carry that energy uh, for some businesses, uh, we should try and carry that energy uh, for all businesses. You know, I think that's the community that we want to be, uh, not just uh, cherry picking what businesses we want to uh, lay out a 5% community fund fee for. Um, why not do that for the other businesses that also uh, sell substances that could be detrimental uh, to our youth. Uh, the, the next thing I want to mention is specifically for you, uh, baseball season is upon us. Little League is here. You've heard me talk about uh, Santee National a lot. Um, I, I, I'm, my kids aren't a part of that program anymore, um, but I am still here as, as an advocate that I, I think that uh, somebody should just check in on them, you know, make sure that uh, they are serving the 450 families, I think, this year that, that they had signed up. Um, check in on how they're allocating their resources. Uh, you know, I don't know how much oversight you have there, but maybe you could be a, an honorable, you know, mention on the board or, you know, something like that. I know last year they operated the entire season without a budget, uh, you know, and, and I just think they're squandering the, the fields over there at, uh, you know, uh, Chet F. Harrett. Uh, you know, those are all great assets in our community. And if the right organization does not uh, value what they have there, um, you know, I just would encourage you to kind of just see what they have going on and see if it's up to your standards uh, for the families that they are serving. Uh, because for me, it, it didn't feel that way, uh, you know, and, and they did not want to hear my voice. Um, so maybe they, they will hear, you know, somebody else's voice about the, the organization that they have going there. Thank you. And no further real, speakers, sir. Real quick on the first subject you brought up, yeah. they were actually out of compliance. Those, yeah. signs, those signs were out of compliance to begin with, so they've been, they've been removed. They were, they were told very quickly, um, and yeah, that, that's already something that is not supposed to be allowed, and they know now. Cool. <laughs> I think it's the day I saw one banner still up. I don't know if that's in compliance or not, but you know, they, the other one's got removed. Yeah, it's actually bolted into the ground. I to get someone out there to take it down. <laughs> Any other speakers? No further speakers, sir. Uh, city Council reports, Councilman Hall. Councilwoman Cobal. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, Ron and I attended the, um, it's the Shark Grossmont Hospital. Tran it's called Transfer of Care. It's a collaborative with uh, Fire Chiefs, Grossmont Hospital. We show up. <laughs> um, it's county. Um, Anyway, the, the whole goal is to reduce the wait times on the wall, as they call it, uh, when they take um, uh, when they take somebody to the hospital in an ambulance, and, and then you've got you know our st our staff or Al Cajon or whoever um, waiting on the wall to get them into the emergency room, and um, we've been sitting on this for I mean they meet once a month to talk through the issues. Grossmont <laughs> Hospital has been great; they've been great. 
Um, but to work through the issues to reduce that time on the wall. And uh, we had a meeting yesterday, and they were showing a – they provide us with graphs with all the information. I'm happy to give this to the city manager to make copies for you so you all – you can see it. Ron says she has it, so, you know, she can share it. Um, but they were talking about the last few months, and they've just never seen numbers like this. They don't have enough beds. They've never seen numbers like this. And they couldn't um, tie it to – flus, you know, like everything that was coming in was all over the map. And they were just so many more beds being used. And, uh, you know, they, they can't talk about probably what the real reason is. But Ron and I looked at each other, you know, I mean, it's the border crisis, right? It's all, it's all the uh, immigrants that, you know, if they have some kind of medical issue, then they're also um, overwhelming and it's not, not just Grossmont Hospital. They told us it's all hospitals right now. So I just wanted to share that that is definitely happening um, in our community hospitals. And, and Ron does have a comment about that. Yeah. So to give you an idea, there's an individual that came up. We did not get his name. We did not get too much information on him. But um, it was coming up where every day uh, he would uh, dial 911. So I'm not assuming he has a phone. And he would want lunch, so they would have to take him up to the hospital. He would eat lunch, and then he would they would he would just walk out. And it's basically been used as a taxi service. Our nine one ones have been used as taxi service. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about that, but many times they'll just end up getting a, the free ride up to Grossmont Hospital and turn around, and walk right out. That's and yeah. that's a different scenario. That, that it's a known. This is a new anomaly in the last couple of months, but that's obviously another issue that they're dealing with. Like the, the, that's this been particular going on for gentleman years. makes five calls a day. <laughs> that's been going on for years. Yeah, yeah. and that's been, yeah, it has and been. this this new one is just, you know, the, the beds are overwhelmed, and it, it's a... The gross month's done a great job of bringing it down to 30 minutes, uh, which is required by law. Now you have, to, you have to get them out by 30 minutes. And... Uh, but you know, somebody, but now they're saying we have so many people coming in that we can't do that anymore. We're not being able to do that. So they're they're running into problems with that. They had 400 patients the other day, and they're only equipped for like 300. Yeah, the the federal government has created an issue where our state law can't. There's no logistical way to do it now. So there you go. You guys like to uh, report, if, if you haven't seen some of the promo videos, I have a series of community coffees coming forward in this year. Um, these are not city events. They're, they're literally our constituent uh, communication that I have coming forward. The first one's coming up here next Monday, uh, January 29th at 7 p.m. It's at the venue next to Pathways Church. So any of the citizens that are in District 4, I encourage you to come out and just come talk to us. We'll have a few friends there, um, some other... Um, uh, people you can talk to about the city and, and just, uh, you know, just a quick hour of coffee and with, the, with our community. So it's kind of cool. And I am happy to report that, um, as, as I said, I was a commissioner on the Heartland Fire Training Authority, and there, the facility out there is just done so well now. Um, the burn rooms, the, 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 the different uh, structures that have been uh, brought out there over the years I mean, it's been a long time coming. There are finally a number of them that are up and operational, um, not only the city of Santee, but the surrounding communities, fire departments, emergency services are getting some of the best training and, and have now have locations and apparatus that uh, allow them to get the best training available in, 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 the, in, the, in the zone that we represent. Um, it's, it is pretty cool. I was just there for the last meeting, and it was packed with – with every agency that uh, Heartland Fire, you know, serves um, and seeing everybody out there together and just learning all, you know, in all the different, um, diff it was like, it was it reminded me of back when we went to Pendleton one time and, you know, they were taking us to different sections and how they train the, you know, the soldiers in different, to, to operate under different uh, circumstances. Um, having all those different abilities in one location now is really a kind of a cool thing. And uh, I think I, we're getting recognition throughout the state for that for that facility. So uh, it's a really cool thing, and we're fortunate to be a part of it. 
Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Uh, just two real quick items. One, I want to thank staff for their efforts on the race walk that occurred this past weekend. I had a chance to go down there and see some of our uh, future Olympians, current and future Olympians, compete. And so staff did a great job setting that up. They were very thankful and very supportive. And thank the council for supporting that activity. Uh, and then just a quick reminder for those sitting at home or here in the room, Santee Discovery Day is this week. It is January 27th at Walker Preserve. Uh, it's got a lot of opportunities to have some fun looking at what's going on on our trail systems and find out more about what you can do here in Santee. There is a video on Santee TV. You might want to pull it up. It's very cute, uh, done by one of our recreation staff. And I just want to promo that. Come on out. Uh, catch it this weekend because we're going to get it between the rain weekends. So that's probably pretty good. So thank you very much, sir. City Attorney? No report. All right, next. Uh, closed sessions, items 7 and 8. Clerk, read the items, please. Item 7, Conference with Legal Counsel Existing Litigation, Government Code Section 54956.9D, name of the case, Preserve Wild Santee versus City of Santee, case number 37, 2022, 0041478. Item 8, Conference with Legal Counsel Anticipated Litigation, Government Code Section 54956.94D, D4. Case, number of cases, one case involving 11011 Meadow Terrace Drive. Mr. Vice Mayor, just to, for the record, <clears throat> we'll hear these items in the reverse order, and uh, Council Member McNellis will be recused on item 7. Okay. Thank you, sir.
All right, you ready? <laughs> I let the record reflect the city council met in closed session. Um, all members were present except Mayor Minto, who was absent. Regarding item number seven, the city council received a report about the existing litigation. Councilmember McNellis recused him on this item. And item number eight, by a unanimous vote, the council authorized the initiation uh, regarding the conditions at 11011 Meadow Terrace Drive. Meeting adjourned.